All right, so like I said, we're gonna roll back to starting to talk about targeted proteomics again at this targeted proteomics course uh, where you learned all about discovery proteomics for the entire day. Um, some of this is going to sound familiar and that's intentional. I wanna kind of, I want you to recall some of the things that we've talked about earlier this week, like the steps of targeted assay development um, and review some of the things that Mike had said on uh, Tuesday morning about building prior knowledge. So that part will hopefully sound familiar, and if it doesn't, this gives you a chance to kind of revisit those ideas. I want us in this uh, quick section to bridge um, detection and quantitation principles and think about how they work together in assay development. Um, so kind of the overarching idea there is that we can't quantitate anything we don't already detect. However, not everything we detect is quantitative. So it's kind of like the squares and rectangles thing, right? Um, so we can't quantify everything that we detect, uh, but everything that uh, we quantify has been detected. Does that kind of, we'll go over this. Um, the last thing we're gonna do um, is think about how to generalize the assay development workflow steps, um, especially in the context of everything you've done today with DIA MS. So, up on the agenda, first we're going to do a little bit of that reviewing and reframing. And then we're going to talk about prior knowledge with DIA compared to those conventional workflows. So I'm hoping throughout this you're kind of going uh, back in your mind um, to what you did today versus what you did the past couple days. So right off the bat, I want to remind you we talked about how a targeted or a quantitative um, experiment would be uh, scalable and have sensitive quantity. Uh, quantifications, while a discovery style experiment uh, might be scalable uh, and have comprehensive peptide detection. And I kind of gave you this teaser that today, on Thursday, we were going to talk about potentially having it all with data independent acquisition or SWATH. So we had talked about uh, this, this workflow where we might start with some type of sample. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a case study in cerebrospinal fluid, so CSF. Um, kind of the fluid that your, your brain is, is floating in. Um, all the kind of steps of protein extraction to enzymatic digestion to get peptides for mass spectrometry, which we then separate by liquid chromatography, and then we're gonna analyze today by DIAMS. So using this case study of cerebrospinal fluid, imagine your boss or you are writing a grant um, your goal is to build a targeted LCMS assay for human uh, cerebrospinal fluid. So I want you to just take a minute and either think in your head or go back to your notes or talk to your friends um, to copy their answers. What are some of the steps that you might start with if your goal was to build a targeted LCMS assay for human CSF? And I'll even put this back up here so you can cheat a little. So just a minute to kind of think about what the steps would be, what's the first thing you would do, what is the next thing you might do. You can feel free to talk to each other too. It's not actually a quiz. So some of the steps in a targeted MS proteomics assay development in human cerebrospinal fluid. And if you don't even know where to start, <laughs> that's also okay. <laughs> so you might have recalled, if you look back in your notes, you might have just cheated and seen it anyway. Um, from Mike's Tuesday section, he talked about building prior knowledge for targeted proteomics and how the particular workflow he was advocating um, started with potentially making a recombinant protein for whatever proteins you were interested in CSF. So you might start there to start figuring out what peptides could be detected from that protein, selecting transitions and retention times for those peptides, assessing the stability of those peptides, validating those peptides in the CSF matrix, and then finally optimizing all of that. 
And one of the things I want to point out in this workflow is that's a lot of work. That is, <laughs> that is starting with already knowing what proteins you might be interested in right off the bat. You have to know what you want to look for. You're doing these rounds of acquisition, making samples, reacquiring data, and every time you plan on adding a new protein target, you have to do it all again. So you've seen versions of this workflow in other slides. I'm just going to show you my version of this workflow where you would target particular proteins based on some experimental hypothesis or a list your boss gave you. You would select peptides either by looking at the literature to see if anybody has ever tried to look at this protein by mass spectrometry before. Um, you might use repositories like spectral library repositories, or you might just make that recombinant protein, shoot it on your mass spectrometer, and see what peptides are, are observable. You go through rounds of refining which peptides you're going to target, which transitions you're going to use in the sample matrix. Here we're going to use CSF. Then you would validate all of these to assess the stability. You would validate them um, for uh, principles like Andy Hufnagel had mentioned, doing calibration curve, doing linearity. Um, and then finally, you would compile those targets. And then the very next time someone asked you about a different protein, you would return to the start and do it all over again. So there's a lot of uh, uh, very um, uh, standardized workflows for doing this, and a lot of labs have really got this down to an art and can do it very quickly. Um, it requires a lot of uh, materials, like a protein or a peptide standard, um, so you can use the recombinant protein, like Mike had mentioned. Uh, you could uh, order synthetic peptides, heavy labeled synthetic peptides, but you're still going to have to do multiple rounds of acquisition, and this whole process is going to be repeated every single time you want to add a new protein. So instead, what we're starting to think about is building prior knowledge using data-independent acquisition. So this workflow would look a little bit different now. Instead of selecting what proteins you're interested in, you would start with whatever reference material you're interested in. So here, instead of starting with, I'm interested in a protein in CSF, start with CSF. The next step would be deciding what peptides and what transitions you're going to use for your targeted assay. So to do this, we're going to exactly use the same thing that you had just used. We're going to use chromatogram libraries, and we're going to search them with something like Walnut, a peptide-centric search. So now we have a list of everything that we can detect in this matrix, not just a single protein that we can detect in a matrix. Then we're going to validate all of these, stability, linearity, um, digestion efficiency, we can validate all of these um, types of principles using what's called a, we're going to call a matched matrix calibration curve. And then finally, from all of those results, we have a refined list of everything we can possibly detect and quantify in CSF. And then when our boss tells us a new protein, we can just go to that list and plug it in. So instead of going all the way back to the beginning, every time we have a new protein to be interested in, we can just go back to a list of validated targets. So we're going to use this case study of CSF. So this is uh, a case study I had done as a proof of principle. And we're going to walk through each of these steps. But one thing that I want you to take away from this slide is that from about 8,000 peptides I detected in a chromatogram library, most were not quantitative. I detect a lot of things in CSF, but most of them are not quantitative. And if you've ever tried to do a targeted assay development before, this is probably something that's painfully familiar to you because most of the things you try to build an assay for aren't going to pan out in the end. So this is similar to what Mike had shown you here on the left-hand side of this on the left-hand side of this slide where he showed at the top the number of peptides or proteins was something like 30. And by the end of these rounds of refinement and validation, um, you're left with maybe three targets surviving all of these, these various um, workflow filters. So we see the exact same thing when we do a DIA MS prior knowledge workflow. So we start with a lot of potential targets, and then we're left with only a, a few strong targets. So we're going to walk through this a little bit. 
And the first step in a workflow like this is to take the matrix that you're interested in and perform these kind of peptide-centric searching algorithms that we had just had you practice. So here, uh, the, the emphasis I want to make is that of that one representative pooled sample, or maybe two representative pool samples, you'll do a deep gas phase fractionation. And this is a deep dive into everything that you could possibly detect by mass spectrometry in your sample without going to additional sample preparation methods. So if you decide later that you want to try an enrichment and go for phosphopeptides, that would be a, a different workflow because now you've changed the matrix by performing an enrichment. Doing this deep uh, gas phase fractionation will give you an on-column library of peptide detections. So that's this orange color here. And then when we go to search, using this on-column chromatogram library, when we go to search our single wide window acquisition injections, you might notice that already we can't quite detect everything in a wide window acquisition that we were able to detect in a deep gas phase fractionated sample. But this kind of makes sense because each of those gas phase fractions we simplified and we dove deeper into the, the uh, matrix that we're interested in. When we widen the windows, it's a lot noisier now and it's harder to make all the same detections. So recall again from the, the previous um, building prior knowledge for targeted proteomics, uh, Mike had shown you this example of uh, apolipoprotein B100. So ApoB protein, where if we had started with some particular uh, uh, sequence, we start with the sequence for this ApoB protein. When we go to look, using prior knowledge, at the DDA, the spectrum counts, we wouldn't have chosen the correct targets for an SRM assay. So that's what these two were showing. You had all of these potential options to choose peptides from in the sequence information. If you use prior knowledge based on DDA, you would not have chosen the correct targets for an SRM assay. So we can do the same thing using DIA. So I'm showing you a Skyline screenshot of the ApoB protein. And if you've noticed in Skyline, if you use a FASTA import, when you hover over a particular protein, it'll show you all the sequence information that I'm showing you on the left-hand side. So it's showing you the full sequence. And everything in blue all the peptides in blue are peptides that I detected. So all of these are peptides in my Skyline document. And you may notice that each of these peaks in the chromatogram is a different color because it's a different peptide. So here's the range of retention times for all the peptides I detected in ApoB using DIA. And you can see the intensity. So a couple of these peptides, maybe this brown peptide right here, might be a good candidate because it looks really intense. But how am I going to choose what's the best target? I, de I detected all of these. They're all potential targets for ApoB, but it's kind of useless to monitor all of them. I don't need to monitor 50-something peptides to measure one protein. How do I choose three to five of the best peptides? So that's where we're going to start talking about the idea of using a matched matrix calibration curve. So we've gotten up to this kind of lime green colored bubble in the workflow. We've got a chromatogram library, a deep chromatogram library. We have everything detectable in one single shot on the mass spectrometer. How can we go from things we detect to things we quantify? So I had mentioned on Monday that peak detection um, should be validated. So not just we're detecting a peak, but we're validating the quantitative. And then I showed you this, this teaser picture down here where I, I'm linearizing a protein. The gray boxes are all the peptides that I detected across this protein. And then I showed you two examples where on the left, the change in signal is a much lower, a much smaller linear range than the peptide on the right where the change in signal has a much larger linear range. So that would mean if I want to measure a change in this peptide, if I want to measure a change in this protein using one of these two peptides as a proxy, 
I would prefer to use the peptide on the right because it has a larger range over which I can make a comparison. So in a targeted mass spectrometry workflow, I mentioned that you would do this by purchasing something like synthetic uh, labeled, uh, isotopically labeled standards for each of the peptides you were thinking about targeting. So this kind of approach works really well when you only have tens to maybe hundreds of peptides. Um, purchasing that number of synthetic standards is, is reasonable. But we're talking now about doing DIAMS, where now we're on the scale of thousands to tens of thousands of peptides. So it's just not going to be feasible for almost any lab in the world to order synthetic standards for this. So instead of using standards, we're going to use a background proteome, a matched matrix. To do this, we're going to be using uh, the label free area of the peaks. If you're coming from a targeted background, this might be scary, but I'm going to prove to you that it works just fine. There's a couple ways you can go about making a matched matrix. And Mike had mentioned before that the lab um, has explored using human plasma diluted with chicken plasma. Um, another way to do these, instead of matching biologies, matching organisms, you could also just biochemically match your matrix. So if you happen to be lucky enough to be working in cells, you can do a cell culture in heavy nitrogen, heavy ammonium sulfate, and now all of the nitrogens in uh, your cell culture will be labeled with 15N. So now the entire matrix, ooh, goodness, the entire matrix will be exactly the same, exact same complexity because it's the exact same organism just everything's 15N labeled, so it won't interfere with the signal from your, your DIAMS. In CSF, we can't grow humans in 15N, so instead we can do a triptic digest in 18O enriched water, and this will label all of the peptides with an 18O. So now we've shifted all of the peptides in this matched matrix. We build a calibration curve just by building a dilution series of the normal, the regular 16O CSF diluted with 18O CSF. And now we can build calibration curves from this. So now I'm showing you three of those peptides from ApoB, so the same protein, and I'm showing you three peptides, three peptide calibration curves. And if you had a choice between the three of these peptides to represent a proxy for ApoB, you would prefer to use one of the peptides on the right-hand side. The peptide on the left was something we detected, but it's very clear that a change in signal does not correlate to a change in quantity. So the signal on the Y, there is no correlation between the signal on the Y and the quantity on the X. These other two peptides do display a change in signal for a change in quantity. The peptide on the far right shows the largest linear range where a change in signal reflects a change in quantity. So are there any questions about this part? Calibration curves can be a little, a little weird if you haven't looked at them too much. So now we have a list of all of the peptides we can detect in CSF, all of the proteins that those peptides represent, and we know their quantitative characteristics. So if someone tells me any protein in CSF, I could tell them what like the top three peptides would be to target. So now that we have a potential list of candidates, I can go to the literature and say, these Alzheimer's disease proteins, which ones are present in my list? And then I can quickly look for those 223 proteins that they have measured and say, these are good biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease and cerebrospinal fluid. I can say either very strict quantitative standards. Of those 223 proteins, I can measure 44 protein groups. Or I can say of those 223 proteins, I'm at least able to detect 96 of those protein groups. And because this is DIAMS, we have not only precursor MZ information, we have fragment MZ information, and we have retention time information. So we've checked all the boxes for all the pieces of information we would need to put this assay on a triple quadrupole. So very quickly, based on the DIA-MS prior knowledge, we're able to export methods 
for our triple quadrupole. So using that information, we, were, we built a 25-minute method for monitoring 51 of the proteins on that list without doing any synthetic standards. And I can do this again very quickly if you handed me another paper, for example, the pain proteome or uh, Gilliam Barr proteome, any list of proteins from the literature, any list of proteins from some differential study that you might do, um, maybe just a hunch, you're curious, maybe this protein is a quantitative protein, a quantitative biomarker, we could look into the, into the assay for that. And the most important thing I want to emphasize is that all of this is enabled by using chromatogram libraries and then expanding on chromatogram library detections to determine which of those detections was quantitative. So if you have any questions, I'll be around for a couple minutes, but I think we're ready, ready for dinner. Prior knowledge with DIA.